the thing that really, I think, helped me and really shaped me was Calc 1 and taking a summer school class because I had to do three hours of summer school class a day followed by two to four hours of tutoring right afterwards. And so it just became this thing that I just did every single day, all day. And it's like, it, that's the thing that really just kind of unlocked it for me is that I was kind of forced to work super, super hard, but it was also on a singular topic and just really kind of helped me kind of hone in this ability to focus for long periods of time. And then all of a sudden it was just like all the problems that I've had up until that moment, I was an overnight ex success after about three to four years of trying. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the eighth episode of the Front of Masters podcast. Hi, I'm Mark Urbanski, CEO of Front of Masters. And today we have the one, the only, the primogen on the podcast. He works at Netflix, by the way. He uses NeoVim, by the way. And I hope you enjoy this conversation. Well, hello, Prime. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, Thank you. We're going to start out with some warm up questions. Okay. And the first one I have for you is How is life on the ranch? The ranch life is wonderful. Uh, it's getting near winter. You are in Minnesota, so you understand the whole winter feel. So I usually love ranch life from about March till about October. And then afterwards, it's not fun life. It's just cold. I have to do a lot of plowing. That's about it. That's life on the ranch. So can you tell us one story from ranch life? One story from Ranch Life. Uh, I can tell you a lot of stories from Ranch Life, but I'll tell you one story from Ranch Life. The very first time we had cows, I didn't really know what was going on. So if you've never heard the term terms for cows, open means it's a female cow that tried to get pregnant and was unable to get pregnant. So they sent them out to pasture to become delicious steaks instead. And so we had six open cattle out on our field. And all of a sudden, my wife comes running in, like kicks open my door. And she's like, ah! like screaming just crazy words i couldn't even understand what she's saying she's like jumping up and down smiling so i'm like all right what's happening then she just takes off whoosh, just disappears so i'm intrigued at this point so i get up i start chasing after her and then it slowly starts dawning on me what she's like screaming about which is that there's a baby cow out there turns out one of the cattle actually was pregnant and had a baby cow and there it is we called that little cow miracle that little cow escaped the cow the the, the pens quite a few times and ran off with other cows and we had to go rescue it and uh, we actually had to hire a professional ro roper at one point to get it off my neighbor's property and so of course we turned it into steaks and i eat miracle weekly at this point delicious cattle by the way but to kind of rewind that story hold on but hold okay, on okay, hold okay, on hold okay, on hold okay, on okay. so to rewind that story i didn't know that there was a cow that was pregnant. Okay, these were open cattle. And one day my father-in-law was like, hey, you need to go put some minerals out there. So I go out there, grab this mineral bag, you know, cut it open, climb the fence, I'm walking over there, and the cattle are just kind of acting strange. I'm like, this isn't kind of going the way I want it to go. So I start pouring in the minerals, and one of them starts running and like does that head thing, like, I'm gonna I'm going to ram that ass. Like it was angry and I had no idea. And all of a sudden it's like four or five cattle running at me and they can run fast. They're like, they're like 30 mile an hour creatures. So I take off, I'm running like, uh, what's his name? John off of not John. What's the Terminator? What's the T 1000s name? I, anyways, detective Doggett from the X-Files playing T 1000. He's running. I'm like running like this fingers pointing and I leap the fence. It's five feet tall. So I just like grab it and throw myself over and the cattle all run up to it. I thought I was going to die. I didn't die. Turns out when they get pregnant, they get really ornery, just like crocodiles. I got all them teeth, no toothbrush. That must have been an incredibly scary moment. It was a very scary moment. And I still look back on that moment and remember that right before I did that, I said, hey, they kind of seem funny, father-in-law. Are you sure I should be going out here? And he's just like, ah, they will love you. Don't worry about it. Almost died. Hashtag that. Well, one of my favorite tweets of yours is actually your like fridge freezer with all of the meat and you're yeah, like that's a miracle hey chat gpt what should i have for dinner <laughs> it was very very delicious i loved that one all right speaking uh, of that by the way on sunday we also had some top sirloin it was very delicious excellent it was miraculously delicious and lately you've been posting some gym photos yeah so what's a typical workout look a like typical workout appears two to three times a day and so it's going to involve some set or just one thing that I'm lifting. So if I'm benching, I'm just benching. If I'm doing curls, just for the girls, right? It's just like each one of those. 
And so like if I start off in the morning and do it, I'll do 10 sets of 10 and some sort of cardio in between each. So if I'm on the bike, I'll do 15 calories of the Peloton, one set of 10 on curls, 15 calories on the Peloton, one set of uh, 10 on the curls. And I'll just go back and forth as fast as I can. Usually I can get it accomplished in about 13 to 15 minutes. And then I leave feeling horrible. And that's kind of the workout or I do a Jacob's ladder. And if I can do eight successful sets of 10, then I go up and wait. Yeah, that's my current round. I've done a bunch of different things. And so this is one of them. And I tried that Jacob's Ladder, and it is no joke. It's not a joke. People do not laugh at Jacob's Ladder. Yeah, you and I had a Jacob's Ladder competition, and sad to say, you destroyed me. I'm, I'm willing to have another competition and willing to destroy you sometime in the future. All right, we'll, we'll have to do that because I've, I've been running a lot. So maybe, <laughs> You're maybe prepared. I'll, yeah, I'm Emotional preparing. Preparation. Uh, so, are there any special skills that you have that people might not know about? I have plenty of special skills, but I only. Reveal them at 3 a.m. in a Chinese food restaurant at TwitchCon. And for those that have seen it, they know I have, I have, I'm a man of a thousand useless skills. In fact, I have so many useless skills that one time there was a conference in 2015 uh, in San Francisco. I forget its name. And they had a uh, MacBook giveaway for whoever could plug in 18 Ethernet cables and 12 hard drives the fastest. I beat everybody. It was awesome. It felt good. I'm very good at very dumb and useless talents. Fantastic. Uh, so what's a typical morning routine look like for you? So I go with the Alex Hermosi morning routine. And that is I wake up at, say, 5.30, 6 o'clock, whatever time I wake up. I wake up, walk out, hit the coffee, pour it in, go straight to work and work until like 10 or 11 or 12. No breaks. No, There's no warm-up routine. None of that. Just go straight there. Because there's this always, there's this kind of like funny story that he tells, which is when people first start out and they just like are really trying to make something happen, they're just, you know, like balls to the wall going after stuff. They're going all in on it, right? They wake up and just immediately go to work, just work as hard as they can. And then that's that. And then when they sell their first company or get whatever kind of level of success, then they wake up, they do their workout routine, they hit the red light therapy, they jump in the cold, go into the hot, go into the cold, go into the hot, go into the cold, vitamin B, getting TRT, do it all like they do like all these 9,000 things before they start work. They have a three hour morning routine. And then everyone looks at that and they're like, to be successful, you got to have a three hour morning routine involving ice baths and infrared lasers being shot at you. But the reality is that's not what got them there. And so I kind of just always kept that idea, which is I'm just going to not do any of that. I'm just going to just, just bow and just wake up, wake up in my hoodie with my headphones on and we go straight into it. Yeah, that's honestly how I built my career as well. Like just wake up and do the thing. Yeah. Do the thing that needs to be done. Then I have all the, all the good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Later on. And I generally do run like in the evenings. I, I do the sauna at night. Uh, so do you get yeah, those red infrared lasers going on? No, I don't. But okay. just I do the dry sauna. But Okay, oh, the dry sauna. Yeah, yeah. It is interesting, though. You're talking about, like, getting your stuff done at the beginning of the day. Yeah. Yeah. That's No messing around. I just go straight. No messing I know around. the whole idea is you're supposed to, like, take it easy, wait 90 minutes before your first cup of coffee, Alex Huberman style. But it's just like, I I mean, for Who me. Who does that? I know. First off, I just don't believe that. I know there's science and all these great things behind it. Uh, they also killed Galileo. So I don't know about all this nonsense. Second off. I think the most important thing, well beyond all the science and all that, is just whatever you do, do the same thing. Like that is 10 times more valuable than trying to find the most optimal morning routine. Just do the same morning routine. You're going to wake up. You're going to feel great. It's going to eventually feel really good, and you're going to be able to have like all this momentum every single morning. And so the yeah, easiest yeah. way to do that is just to do immediate work right away. Yeah, so I mean four hours of working you've done more than probably everybody else has done yeah in an entire day that's one of the benefits and yeah. it's really deep in the morning so there's no meetings and plus everyone's off in pacific time i'm in montana time greatest time zone from the greatest state and uh that means i'm an hour ahead so by the time it's 10 o'clock my time it's nine o'clock their time and everyone knows the valley nobody strolls in before nine o'clock so at that point i'm like i'm maxed out i've already i've done full day of focused work with not a single meeting awesome all right so i'm gonna rapid fire need your opinion on these things. All right, so we're going right. to first start out with Node.js. I'm surprised at how successful it is. All right, TypeScript. 
Uh, it brought all the benefits of a statically typed languages with none of the benefits of a statically typed language. <laughs> uh, Rust. Great language to rewrite in. Zig. Interesting. Go. Practical. Haskell. White paper. <laughs> OCaml. I am deeply intrigued by OCaml. So I have this worry in my life about OCaml, which is I'm going to love OCaml because you can already see it happening in Teach right now. But once you go down the functional language route, the ML family of languages, people, it's just like for whatever reason, guess what? Once you like it, all of a sudden it's like something bites you and you're just like, there is, I, why, why are we using C-based syntax? It's, it's, it's incorrect. This is, truly is the way we should have been programming. And it just seems like once you make that jump, you can never come back. Yeah, it just feels so good. Fear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it feels so good when you're writing the code, but then nobody else wants to read exactly. it. Exactly. No one else wants to, but what happened if it truly is the best? Maybe it is the best. Just saying. Uh, all right, C++. Annoying. I, I, don't, I, I don't really like C++. The problem about C++, that's the problem about any language, but I feel like C++ just excels in it, which is you can make complicated things. Uh, algorithms. Great. You should know them. You have a, got a shout out your algorithms course. Frontendmasters.com yeah. slash trial. It's, it's free. It's free forever. Free Ever, forever. Forever. And then we're doing a second algorithms course. Yeah, we're going to do a there's going to be a second algorithms course. I'm sure it'll be live at some point on the website. That one will be a little bit deeper, a little faster, a little more whiteboardy. And by a little bit more, I mean 110% only whiteboard, pseudo code, pseudo intellectual, pseudo everything. All right, next one. GraphQL. <laughs> uh, Come on, don't hurt me like this. All right. Uh, one more that's gonna hurt you. Uh, React and Next.js. Oh, so I'm gonna give I'm gonna give a, I'm gonna give a nuanced take. Are you ready for uh, this yeah, one? Yeah. I think React was an amazing iteration and allowed for a lot of cool ideas to be tested that have never been tested. And what I mean by that, of course, is ways to build software. I think Next.js is best, obviously, betting heavy on uh, React, but it's hard to think of Next.js versus uh, all the things for sale offers. And so are we talking about just Next.js? Are we talking about like the whole gambit that is for sale with the image caching, font caching, pre-rendering, blah, 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 blah. Um, I think there's a lot of cool stuff that went on and I'm very happy with a lot of the outcomes. I still think pre-rendering is probably the coolest iteration. Uh, it's probably the biggest win W of RSCs ever. I think it's going to be their only win. Called it. Uh, but I, I mean, I think it's great. I think there's plenty of great things about it. I just don't like it because I, I am like, some amount of developers when if there is a tool available, I'm going to use the tool. And sometimes tools make things more complicated or they make it easier. And I find abstract, like, how do I put this well? Abstractions that give you full control tend to be good. Abstractions that wrap things and repackage them tend to be difficult. And I think of this a lot like logging. There's logging that lets you know a problem happened and then there's logging that's trying to debug the problem that happened. And if you have alerts and logging or tools designed to try to pinpoint where problems happen, they're almost always bad. They almost always are way too much information. They almost always are impractical. They almost always don't really do what you want. Whereas tools that like just tell you something is wrong almost always are super nice, right? Because then you still do the debugging, you still go through that, but you get that information right away. So I've, I don't know, it's just, that's kind of how I look at it, which is I feel like React is doing, uh, or kind of like the mod, I shouldn't say just React, I should say the modern front end approach is trying to have your cake and eat it too. Whereas I'm not sure if I like that. Yeah, one of, I think my favorite takes of yours towards this is like the fact that every plugin needs to be like, React this, react that, yeah. react whatever, and it versus making like general purpose utilities that work yeah. for whatever the problem is. You just need that utility for that thing. Yeah. Instead, it has to be wrapped and packaged for this one ecosystem and in this one way. It all has to be interoperable with 
yes. React's way of rendering JSX or whatever. Yeah, and that's like a specific problem with React because I, and I'm, I it might be a specific problem also with Solid JS. I know that Svelte doesn't really have that problem. Svelte's ecosystem is just the JavaScript ecosystem, so there's a lot of benefits to that kind of approach. I like what they've done. I think that it's probably the most compelling front-end framework right now is Svelte, if I were to use one. All right, the next one. It's a, a transition into uh, your thoughts on HTMX. Oh, I love it. We already know this. We know this, okay? But you uh, just said you would use Svelte, so. Uh, yeah, I said if I were to use a front-end framework. Okay, so you I don't consider, consider HTMX a front-end framework at all? No, no, I don't think it's a front-end framework. It's, yeah. just a, it's, it's, like, it's just a data-fetching library. That's how I look at it. It lets me try to write a back-end and a front-end like how I would imagine real-time video games are created. I know it's not, that's not like, True, like anyone that knows real-time video games knows it's all UDP and then you got to send up keystrokes and all that and things get painted and rendered and all the states kept on the server and transferred back down to the client. But HTMX is kind of like that, except for the frame that gets sent down is static and never needs to be sent down again until there's an interaction which generates a change on the server, which then generates the change on the client. That's kind of like how I like to think of it in my head. Yeah, we're trying to figure out on frontofmasters.com where we want to integrate HTMX and are you actually thinking about doing it like we, we, yeah we we might uh we probably will we probably will honestly but yeah we we do have like the the giant dashboard application that's you know react mm -hmm. uh spa world and then we you know frontendmasters.com is all vanilla and so in a way HTMX is kind of like a third paradigm yeah right because we have like the vanilla Hugo go approach uh, that we use on frontendmasters.com and then the yeah the spa react approach and now we're trying to figure out where does it make sense to use HTMX. So one thing that's cool that you could technically do with HTMX and frontendmasters.com because you do full page reloads when you transfer things, right? Uh, right yes. when you click yeah. yeah. So you could import HTMX and put a boost because I assume your links up top are uh, they're literally just a uh, and like a, a href. I always call them a refs. I don't know what you call them. Uh, it's just a href up top. And so if you just put boost on the body, that will go and fetch that page and then put the body into it. So you right. get a you literally get the experience of a single page app with just none of the programming. You're just like, all right, all links, all new pages will simply just be refreshed right here. I'm sure there's yeah, some and, JavaScript and complication the, and all yeah, that. Yeah, but. and there's the reason why we wouldn't do that is because Right now, each route kind of loads its own contextual JavaScript. So it can be the most okay. like minimal amount that's needed for that page. And so, yeah, unless HTMX is there actually is that much JavaScript that it requires that? Because you get you also yeah. get like gzip benefits. The large, you know, if you have a big document, you can get some pretty good gzip benefits in there. Yeah, yeah, but we would still have to load all of the code up front in order for that approach to work. Yeah, because we're we're talking about like view transitions. View, view transitions is a similar thing to HX Boost, and it's it still has the same issues with it. Yeah, whereas yeah. our model is like. It's a page. You just load it, load whatever minimal amount of JavaScript is needed. So it's not that there is that much. It's just that currently the template is tied to the JavaScript yeah. for that template. And so it just makes the site super, super fast. I mean, you talk about it being super fast all the time. It's just like each page load is yeah. as small as possible. So what, so. what do you think about uh, the whole no build? I know you're asking me questions. I see the yeah, last one yeah. on the list, but we're going to hold off for a second. <laughs> what do you think about the whole no build wave that DHH is doing, where even his JavaScript has not been built? It's just imported directly from the server. Yeah. I mean, I love the perspective of not needing tooling in the middle. Yeah. Um, so for instance, our CSS is pre-processed. And right now at this point, like what we need a pre-processor for, we really don't need it because CSS has gotten to a point yeah, where it has like good. nesting, it's, you know, variables, all these kinds of things. So like we can pretty much translate out of a build step for our CSS and it just makes the whole process of building your site and shipping it to production easier. Yeah. And I, I'm a big fan of removing, you know, friction and deployment and friction and building and that kind of thing. So um, from that perspective, I like it. Obviously, there's performance benefits to bundling. Like if you want to use TypeScript, you're not going to be able to get away from a bundler. Yep. Um, things like that. So for our JavaScript, we're probably going to stick in the compiled mode. Do you use but TypeScript? We do use TypeScript for 
some of our more complex modules, yeah. Have you considered just going with JS Doc? Uh, we have not, no. But uh, yeah, so we we built that search. You've seen the search yeah, yeah, on yeah, our site. Yeah. It's like nice super, search. yeah, nice it's search. Very, very nice search. Yeah, yeah, very, very nice search. And uh, yeah, super powerful. And that's built in ty TypeScript. And it's a very dynamic module. And the only dependency we have there is lit HTML, which is like a three kilobyte yeah. package. Let, let me just tell people how cool that search is, which is yesterday, during I did a talk on JavaScript performance, someone in the audience live while that was happening was like, Will Sentence said, or someone, not Will Sentence, maybe it was Will Sentence talked about something with performance at a certain level. He's just like, I remember him talking about this. It had to do with promises. So he's like, oh, I'll just search in the search, found the exact spot within just like seconds. And was like, oh, oh, he actually cut it off here and you're starting right here. Okay, this is how these two things worked out. So I was able to figure out someone else's talk on the exact topic in the exact point within probably like 10 seconds. Yeah, so it searches the transcripts, and you're able to actually click to specifically where they mentioned yeah. in the course. And then was able to listen awesome. to it and go, oh, yeah, OK, yeah, he didn't cover this one spot. And guess what? The back button works. The back button works. Impossible. Impossible. <laughs> Apparently, that's a really hard challenge in front-end development. Well, it's because you have to recreate re client button. state yeah. if you go that route. And so anyways, that's funny. Yeah. All right, so next question. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, we're, we're still doing the one word or the, the, the no, 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 no. Oh, well, yeah, we can finish that. The last one was AI. Uh, peaked. Peaked. For a little bit. I, th I mean, I think AI is great. Uh, Chat Jippity is okay. It's both great and bad at the exact same time. Uh, people say it's really great for learning. I think sometimes it's great for learning, but a lot of times you just get really average information. You're not really getting insights in a way that is, that is fantastic. Um, I've enjoyed it for trying to ask questions about algorithms. And sometimes it's OK. Other times, it's just making up stuff. I use it for programming. I think it's great for saying, like, whatever you give it a black box problem. I have a CSV with these three columns, and I want to be able to display a graph uh, in Python. Uh, and I want these three graphs based on this and a histogram with these added values. It can just do that because it's like, I, I input, output, completely known, just produce. But the moment you kind of do more exploratory stuff, you start really hitting some oddities that may or may not be true at all. And I don't know. I find that it's just way less effective there. So I am I am definitely in the plane of disillusionment really quickly. Yeah, it seems to boil all of humans' knowledge into the most like vanilla generic thing. Yeah. Like if that's what you need. Yeah, it it can work. Yeah. I think if I were today to have to go write, say, like a uh, I had to write something that could parse NPM, PNPM, and Yarn packages. Like two years ago, that would have been a really tough thing to do because there's so much different formats and things to do. Whereas today, you just tell Jippity to do that, and it's such a black box problem. It's just like, bam, bam, here you go. Hide that away in a module. It mostly works. It might work 99%. It might even work 100%, and boom, you just never touch that again. And that's, I mean, so there's parts of development that got, sorry for spitting on you. There's parts of development that are really exciting. I really like that. It just takes the average ugh, out of there. Well, I was graced with your saliva, so that's that's, that's why I, I reset was... it so we could we could just <laughs> skip that and you could just edit it right out. I just saw the shine fly across, and I was like, Ooh. "No, we're definitely keeping this in." Ooh. All right, all right. So let's talk about Little Prime. Uh, growing up, or your first exposure to code, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, often I don't talk about Little Prime, especially in public. Um, so. First exposure to code, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's a good joke. It came in later. Um, yeah, yeah. It's time zone difference, really. So first exposure to code was when I was like maybe fifth or sixth grade. I mean, I, I tried to install Doom a bunch and all these other things and played with MS-DOS. I knew how to use kind of DOS a little bit to kind of go around. So I had like a vague familiarity back when I was young because I had the whole Windows 3.1 stop laughing. And... <laughs> Then, Sorry, the time zone. The thing. time zone. Yeah. <laughs> that the, joke the, came the, in late, too. Yeah, time yeah. zones. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so. All right, MS-DOS, we're here. MS-DOS, right, right, I've right, already right. skipped past it. Yeah. So in fifth grade, there's this game called Grawl or Grail, depending on who you ask, uh, played it. I actually, the creator of that streamed on Twitch, and I was able to I was able to raid him and be like, dude, you're the reason why I'm like a computer programmer. No this way. This is so cool. That's awesome. Dude, I can't even remember who it was. I want to say it's Lord Tox was his name, but I, can't, I don't think I'm right on that one. Anyways, so that game, it had a little NPC level editor, and the level editors, you could put in these little NPCs, and when you double-clicked on them, a little script came up. 
And I saw it for the first time. I had no idea what I was looking at, but it was like, if, and I, you know, X is greater than 100, do this. And I was like, I, I could do this. And so I started playing with it. And I was just like, oh yeah, I could do this. I could do this. And I just kind of guessed my way into programming. And it was like a C-like scripting language. And then I could just go through it and start doing stuff with it. And it was pretty easy. And that was like my first exposure into programming. So it's kind of like modding a game. It, it was kind of, yeah, it was more like game scripting in a I game. See. Yeah. 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 So they just had a very few little hooks into the game, a, a small API. It worked. Got it. Yeah, I think about those early games and how like, just the simple models of like basic programming is how a lot of us got into it. Like, yeah. I started with TI 83 calculator games and that kind of thing. That's right. You're a TI 83 champion. If I'm not mistaken, you went to town. Uh, yeah, I absolutely did. Um, except <laughs> for, yeah, I lost one of my prized games. Uh, I wish, wish I had it today. I yeah. learned, uh, learned about backups. Good lesson about backups. Um, yeah, how about like school and, and college? Uh, high school, my teacher said I was the worst student she ever had, 2.16. Uh, drugs, alcohol, bad life decisions, all that kind of stuff. College, dropped out a couple times, and then just took off like a rocket. It was just like at some point everything started making sense, could do really good, also enjoyed computer science, and then crushed it. And then eventually I was the person that got the highest grade every single time. My biggest, my, my three claim, my four claims to fame were first in Calc 1. Calc 1 is when I really started trying to figure out how to get my life together. And that one, I, I went to the math learning center for two to four hours, four days a week. And would just do it every single day right after class, go there and just go through every single problem. And it was really hard and I was really struggling. But by the end of the semester... I felt so confident at the whole the whole nine yards and you know even the 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 like the the proof for different how to do like derivatives and all that kind of stuff that when it came down to the final I got it in under 30 minutes and then handed in my paper and then the next person to get out was at an hour 45 and he came up to me and he was like dude you finished right away how did you do this and I was just like it was it was great I just I just felt like I knew all the things and it turned out I got the highest grade also wow. so I set the curve finished in less than 30 minutes and I did the same thing in calc 2 and then I was the only person to finish the final in calc 4 differential equations uh, out of 400 and some students so I was the only person to finish it and they were gonna <laughs> he said that he was going to downgrade it and take out a question because no one even got to the last question but then I finished it so I kind of ruined it for all <laughs> other people so I was like yeah that's awesome and then in uh, programming languages, uh, the highest grade in the class was like a 20 or a 15%. And then I got a hundred percent on the test. And so I, got, I ended up getting like a 240% for my, my grade. Cause it just like got so wildly curved out. And so it was the only time that I got way high in the, in the curve. That's awesome. Felt good. Ruined everybody else's day. I bet. <laughs> but I, I watched a video you were talking about those days and you're talking about like struggling through like ADHD and like that, that, that success that you're just talking about, you like really worked hard for. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know, that whole dropping out twice out of college thing that happened over the course of years, right? That wasn't some small period of time. And then there was also going back to school and struggling and not getting good grades and all that kind of stuff. It was really the, the thing that really, I think helped me and really shaped me was Calc 1 and taking a summer school class because I had to do three hours of summer school class a day followed by two to four hours of tutoring right afterwards. And so it just became this thing that I just did every single day, all day. And it's like, it, that's the thing that really just kind of unlocked it for me is that I was kind of forced to work super, super hard, but it was also on a singular topic and just really kind of helped me kind of hone in this ability to focus for long periods of time. And then all of a sudden it was just like all the problems that I've had up until that moment I was an overnight success after about three to four years of trying. <laughs> overnight success in it three just, years in the it making. It just happened. It just happened. Yeah. They say it's like, uh, you know, a lot of things are slow than fast. It's like you don't realize a bunch of these small changes that are happening in your life and you don't really, uh, you know, you, you just don't see them. And then all of a sudden, it's like it's different completely. And it's like the slow to fast kind of problem. So, yeah, probably like years of slow and then yeah. all of a sudden fast. Absolutely. Um, and then like, how did you get into kind of like speaking and teaching? I don't know, like the content creation thing, like, like 
content creation was just me going, maybe someone will like it if I program. I don't know. I was really fast at Vim. Okay. I thought it was kind of cool. I was like, you know, I, I my most popular shorts are me doing really great Vim macros. It's like the 360 no scope of the programming world is Vim macros. And so I'm going to start uploading more and more of those because they're really, really fun to do. But yeah, I just happen to have a parlor trick talent. And I think that automatically started drawing people in. And then I can also carry on a conversation while programming. You know, if you just do something for 20 years, it gets easier and easier to do things. And so it's, it just felt easy. Yeah. Just because I had so many years of experience doing it. And so it's more like I just fell into it. Because before that, I was streaming Fortnite. You may have heard of Fortnite. Fortnite, great place. And uh, yeah, so then I just tried programming because that's where my true talent lied. So you weren't like the best Fortniter? I got pretty good at Fortnite. I could definitely crank 90s on the kids, all that kind of stuff. Could do the whole like edit, shoot, reset, edit other side, shoot, reset, edit the swirly staircase to drop on people. Like I could do all those things. Got pretty good at it. But then, I don't know. It's also, it also had, it, it has a huge skill gap. It just, it also had no meaning at the same time. So it wasn't as fun as programming in some sense. Got it's really it. great to zone out, but it's not really great to make a life around. We'll get into content creation a little bit more in the future, but I, I do want to know, like, how did you go from, like, college to, like, Netflix? I graduated school when I was 24, and during that time, from 22 to 24, I was working, like, 80 hours a week, 90 hours a week, 100 hours a week with uh, schoolwork and trying to build websites and all that, inspired by the social network, all that kind of stuff. Jay queried out of my mind. They called me Jay Querious. I was so ready for all this stuff. Uh it was awesome. And then afterwards, for the next year while my wife was still in school, I just spent it doing a startup. So again, there's multiple nights I stayed up all night just programming furiously, absolutely enjoying the entire experience. And then my friend JJ Prum Prum, the micro king, you may have heard of him, pretty good guy. He just came in and he finally called me and said, you know what? I don't think this is going to work out. And right when he said that, I already knew, I already knew that. And I just, boom, gave up. And I was like, fine. And so I went and tried to find a real job. And I found a job at a place called Schedulicity. And Schedulicity hired me. And six months into Schedulicity or five months into Schedulicity, I just felt so frustrated. The work was so boring. And so I was just like, oh, man, I just got to figure out how to be happy. I got to learn how to be content in every situation. I'm just going to be that. I just have to be that. Arrive to work. Before I walk in, I go and get coffee at, I think the place is called Rockford. It's right across the street in Bozeman, Montana. Bozeman, Montana, by the way, great place. It's where HTMX, you know, is being developed from right now. Headquarters, HTMX. And when I went there, this guy named Ivan Judson came up to me and was like, hey, you're a programmer, right? And I was like, yep. And he's like, you want to come work for uh, web filings? I'll uh, pay you 50% more. So I was just like, okay, and we went and did that. And so then I worked at uh, Web Filings for about a year and a half, and it was a very hard job. I was doing 60-plus hours a week. It was very demanding. I learned the most I've ever learned from any job ever at that job. It was fantastic. And then by the end of that, so I'm about two years into my professional career at that point, uh, Netflix interviewed me and hired me as a senior software engineer. Wow. Felt good. Yeah. Overnight so, success. Overnight success. So what would you, uh, <laughs> like, what would your advice be to somebody who's like younger who wants to, to take that path? Uh, I think that you gotta, you gotta, you gotta plan for overwhelming work. I, you know, I think that anyone that tells you you can get all these things done and you're going to live this nice life, the beach life, and you know, you're going to study for a little bit and then you're just going to have all this great work life balance. It's so nice. Yeah, I mean, that does exist, and I could probably settle into something like that where I don't do a lot, but I had to first do an incredible amount of work to begin with because I had to be, like, there has to be a reason for a place to hire you. They have the pick, like, right now, especially in today's kind of, like, engineering economy, if you will, they have the pick of the litter every single time. They can hold a position open, hey, we'll pay anyone 150 but we're going to wait and find the best person we can find. And so you're really competing. It's a zero-sum game. I mean, unfortunately, job jobs are, in a sense, a zero-sum game. So you have to sit there and just, like, how do you stand out from everybody else? You're not going to stand out from everybody else if you're putting in 20 hours a week of learning. You just, you just won't. Like, so that first, like, three, four years, if you're not just willing to really go intense, it's going to be extremely hard to do something or work somewhere really awesome. Now, Maybe that's not your goal, and you don't have to do that. Maybe it's fine to just go work at some, you know, C sharp 
medical place that things move slow and that's okay. And that's what you want to do. And like, that's totally fine. Also, it's just, you got to figure out your destination and then just understand that some journeys are really hard. Yeah. When you first described it, I thought of those like videos on TikTok about programming. I know. <laughs> they, dude, I, TikTok is the place I'm hated the most universally. And you even said this yourself. Yeah. Like, you get the most negative comments when you put me on TikTok because I'm the only programmer TikToker, I feel like, that says, yeah, it's going to be really, really hard. Learn to type well because that's a super valuable skill. You're going to definitely want that as you're just cranking out code trying to understand. Learn to work long hours to begin with because you're going to, it just takes so much time and effort to learn anything. There's so much to learn and you got to learn all those things and be proficient at all these things and actually be able to move the needle. Like that just takes a long time. And just for whatever reason, YouTube loves it. TikTok hates it. Instagram's in the middle, Twitter high fives, right? And, and Twitter also, you get a lot. Twitter's like the extreme, right? It's like Instagram, but angrier. And so <laughs> they love it and hate it. Absolutely. I think you summarized all the social networks pretty, yeah, really did. pretty damn well. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you've been at Netflix for a while. Can you story, uh, tell us like a story about like your career there? Like how, how long have you been at Netflix? Uh, let's see. Today is the 15th or 16th of November, right? Yeah, something like 15th of November. Yeah. Okay, okay. So in, uh, let's see. in 19 days, I've been there for 10 years. Wow. Yeah, on the books, technically in 18 days will be my first day at Netflix because I came a day early and watched a presentation and met a bunch of people. Biked 12 miles to get there. We only had one car, wife was pregnant, and I just grabbed a bike and biked down the Guadalupe Trail to the Los Gatos Trail and made it all the way to Netflix. Building A, theater, forget the name of the theater. Theater room, A1. So do you have any stories from Netflix that you can share? Yeah, I'm sure I got, I got plenty of stories I could share at Netflix. Uh, I. Let's see, what my favorite story of Netflix, this is old Netflix. Old Netflix doesn't exist anymore, but this is my favorite story about Netflix. In 2000, let's see, I think it was 2016 we announced we're going to go global and unlock pretty much every country that the U.S. is legally able to operate in. Like, I don't think, like, we can't operate in certain countries. I forget the list of the countries. There's, like, U.S. government says you can't have a thing here. So all the countries you could legally open up in. And... The thing you don't know about that story, and most people don't know about that story, is that for one year before that, all the UI teams knew about it. We were building ways to do all the different translations, building in more dynamic ways to handle all this stuff. A lot of work went into that. And for a year straight, we all knew this was coming, and we all knew it was going global, and not a single thing got leaked. Like, that is such a cool experience. You can have a building full of 1,000 people, and nobody says a word. I loved those days. Those were great days. Netflix was still in this idea of freedom and responsibility, hire adults only, and everyone there took it pretty seriously. Feedback was really serious. Now I feel like I don't, you don't get feedback. I don't get feedback. It's just kind of, it's just a different feel. It's just not the same Netflix as it once was. Is that bad? Is that good? I think it's partial bad. It's not the same place, but I still really like it there. It's, oh, it's still, a lot bigger. It's, like it's what, just a lot bigger. You can 10, 12 times bigger. Like what, I don't know if it's that much bigger, but it is It is bigger. I have no idea how many people work at Netflix. I know I looked it up once. It's like 12,000 or something like that. But I don't know. Just not the same as it once was. Times move on. Times are changing. Times are changing. Um, I, was also I, call, I was also called an idiot in one of my code reviews. So is it better? Is it worse? You know, it's a thing, right? I, they're still cranking out lots of cool stuff. <laughs> cranking so. out cool stuff. So, it's, right. you know, yeah. there you go. There's a good yeah. story. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thanks. Um, so <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> how do you? How, how did you start teaching in front of masters? Uh, I asked you. No, Jim. Yeah. Asked you, and then Jim and I were talking about an intense topic, and I forgot that you were also on the Twitter DM thread, <laughs> and so you got exposed to oh, no. me accidentally sending a message to the wrong group. Oh, those are good days. So, and then you still let me come. And, and I still let you. you come. Yeah. So, like, yeah. How did you decide, or why did you decide to be like, I, I want to try this teaching thing? Jim always said it was really great. Okay. So I just knew Jim. So Jim just kept saying, No, this is definitely the move. You got to do this. Trust me, it's way better to do this. And so then I was just like, Fine, I'll go if you let me teach Vim. And you let me. A uh, risky move, risky move. Uh, yeah, there's some caveats there. We're like, we're we're gonna try it. We'll see. 
It and worked out yeah, pretty well. It, it went worked Vivint awesome. Still, yeah, it's still, yeah, yeah. We uh, put it on the the back end learning path. I think that's helped a lot. Yeah, because it's. I mean, I think it's fundamental. Yeah, like you gotta. You gotta, gotta know how to use the motion yeah, you stuff. Gotta, yeah, yeah, especially if you're gonna work on any type of server whatsoever. Yeah, if you have to just it's log onto a server, there's gonna yeah. be Vi at least. In Vi, you're gonna have most of the moves. You're probably gonna have Vim. You're gonna have all the moves you need to know. Like I can still work in Vi. It's just not very comfortable, but I can. So you started on Vim, but why did you keep continuing? I mean, I think you're on your seventh. Okay, so I didn't start on Vim. I started on NetBeans, okay? okay? I was the fastest on the keys. You should have saw me during those days. Oh, man, I was so speedy. Uh, then I went to... I tried Eclipse for a moment, dog water. Uh, then I tried Sublime for a little while, dog water. Then I tried um, VS Code. Or then I tried IntelliJ. Stuck there for a long time. And then I had a friend. Uh, his name is uh, uh, Bogart uh, Tiberi. He said, hey... I'm going to try Vim. You should try Vim too. And I was like, all right, I got this. And so I tried Vim because I knew I was fast on the keys. I knew I could type fast. And from there, that's what I did. And it was awesome. And I loved it. And the first week was absolute hell. And then afterwards, I got kind of fast. And I was like, ooh, I could get faster. And then it just kept on going. and kept on getting better. And I was like, oh, this is exactly what I've always wanted was the ability to really control the cursor instead of using up, down, left, right, and control and shift. I was just so fast on those things. And so, I, yeah, I really, really liked that. Absolutely thought that was the best. And so then after years of doing that, Yunong uh, from Netflix, he said, hey, you should just use Vim. So like 2016, I was really considering using Vim. And then a guy named Anders Backen could just go so fast in Emacs. And another friend named Guy Serino could just go so fast in Vim. I already knew the Vim motions. And I was just like, I want that, right? Whatever I've been doing, it's not that. And that's what I want. And so then I figured it out. And it was totally worth it. And so then can you type like incredibly fast? Like what's your word per minute? Uh, I, I can't type nearly as fast as I once was able to. Switching to the Vorax slowed me down and switching to a Kinesis keyboard slowed me down a little bit. Uh, so I'm probably at like, I whenever I do a program or a typing thing on on Twitch live, I get like, like somewhere between 110 and 120. So it's like, I'm not as fast as I once was, but I can type the, mo the, the motions for Vim. Yeah. I can type way fast and so last time i built a little key monitor for it it was in the 400s because typing predefined motions i can go really 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 uh, really fast because yeah, yeah. it's a repeating kind of thing yeah, it's like the actions per minute in like video games like yeah. those uh those mm or what, what are they They're called, called real-time strategies starcraft 2 by the way yeah yeah, yeah that okay yes Whatever. i've modeled my workflow after starcraft 2 sweet yeah that's awesome that's how Har the, harpoon came around and then yeah, so you turn that in, you're like, okay, I can I can go really fast. I'm going to try this con content creation thing. Like you did you start on Twitch then or did you yeah, start yeah, on YouTube? Yeah, I was on YouTube? Twitch. I was on Twitch. Uh, it went it went well. Yeah, I'd get like 30 people watching me. I was one of the biggest ones in the science and tech category that was not earthquakes or chickens. That's like such inside baseball if you don't know, you don't know. No, I don't know. I Y K Y K. Okay, that's just how it goes. Yeah, so why is Twitch such an important place for you? Uh, cuz I don't I, I've never loved the creation of of content in the YouTube form. I really like the live aspect. There's like a whole different energy and feel to it, and it just feels so good. Yeah. So I just love it. I mean, that's kind of the history with Front End Masters, because I started like, okay, I'm going to do conferences, whatever. I, I want to teach. I started doing conferences, and then I was like, okay, people want to learn real skills. So I started making screencast courses, but it's just like, I'm just me and my computer and a camera and it's just it's not the same feel. yeah it's not the same feel so that's where i started teaching workshops and having yeah. a live audience and then we started doing the the live streaming and then you kind of pushed us into hey you should try this uh twitch thing yeah yeah i pushed so. a lot of people into that uh one thing i i uh, made an early deal with myself uh early on in the twitch world which was i i'm not an educational channel uh I'm more of an edutainment channel. Like I, I build things. I will read, you know, this was before even reading articles and all that, but I'm not going to go through and try to teach everybody because teaching is a very transac transactional experience. Whereas like an entertainment, building something, being able to respond is like a completely different kind of thing. And people want to come back for that. They want to be a part of that. And the more people that are a part of it, the more fun it actually is. And so I wanted to kind of build that experience out. And so... Then now that I'm doing a lot of article reading and still building, that that changes. That's just super fun now. Now it's just like the best. Yeah, and you're like almost known more for your article reading <laughs> lately. Yes. 
People right. know me more as the prime time than they do as the prime gen. Yeah. That's wild. And like, how do you balance all the things you're doing? You're obviously carefully ne Netflix and okay. then uh, content creation and then so these things, which you told me you're like, this is too much front yeah, masters. Yeah, yeah front end masters doing three courses at once was by far too much i think even if i wasn't doing content creation it's probably too much just in general it's emotionally painful yeah uh, but to balance all those things is truly not hard you just need partners and so my editor flip he's really good at just i mean he's just really good uh he, you know he may not be the world's greatest editor uh he he, he's definitely not the world's greatest speller. We've had a few spelling mistakes, but he is like by far someone that can take a vision and run with it, be very independent. Like I would much rather not have the world's, the world's greatest editor, but have someone that is really good at editing, but more importantly, really good at just coming up with a vision and executing with no guidance, right? That is like 10,000 times more important because that means I can actually do something else. I can actually execute on something completely independently. And that is worth way, 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 way more. And so he is like the first great partner and we partnered up pretty early to start making things and that's just been awesome. And then uh, my second partner, which I would never refer to as a partner because she would actually slap me if I did, my extremely beautiful wife, uh, she, she really, really does help me. She does a lot of things for me. Um, I've been called a misogynist because she brought me food a few times on stream. That's not actually like that doesn't, there's no demands here. She just does it because she loves me and doesn't do it very frequently, but nonetheless does it every now and then. And that's just awesome. And so she has just like helped reduce a lot of the complications. So she takes care of like exactly how she literally books all of my stuff that I need to do and helps me stay on track. And she also runs a bunch of other stuff and she's very, very smart and she's very, very good, and she's very, very awesome. And so she just helps me stay focused on work because that provides for that just provides for our house, and then stay focused on the content creation because that's just been going really, really well, and she's very happy about it. So she's just like, I will do the other things, uh, just because she wants to see me succeed. And so, and then the things that she is trying to do, I try my hardest to help her succeed in those things. And so it's just been great. So she is truly the. Uh, the reason why I can be more successful. Yeah. So like, how's the, what's the mindset and like keeping the energy up? It's, it's that partnership you're talking about. Uh, what do you mean by energy up in this, in this situation? Well, just like your energy to do all these things. Like every day you're, you're waking up and you're hitting it for oh, yeah, four yeah. hours she's and then huge, you're doing the next thing. She's a, she's a, she's a huge part of it. Obviously I could never do it without her. So even if I live by myself, I had no kids or wife, I still don't think I could do all of this without her. Even though I have more things to do, I think it's not possible without somebody else, right? If you ever saw that, I think it's Coachella, I think. Uh, you ever see the crazy dancing man by himself that turns into a big crowd video? There's like a thousand LinkedIn inspirational posts about it, but generally the idea is that there's it requires one crazy person to got, has to go out there and starts doing something weird. But for it to be successful, you need a second person to come along and join in the crazy, and then other people feel like they can join in. And so my wife really is that second person. I could go out there and dance by myself, but until I had my wife, unless I have my wife there, like I can't turn it into anything. And so she is, she's the secret sauce. That's super sweet. Yeah. I love that. Uh, so have you had any like mentors or any, is there anybody you look up to currently? Uh, I don't have any mentors. Uh, all my mentors were definitely during college time. I was the very important people throughout my life. Uh, I don't have like, I don't like have idols, if you will, or like people that I, I, I'm just like, oh, I wish I could be this guy. You know, everyone kind of has their strengths and weaknesses. I'm no fool to all those kind of things that everyone, if you meet your idol, it almost exclusively, it's not a great experience because you're just like, oh, they're not who I thought they were. Right. So that happens. I don't want to, you know, so I just don't try to put that on anybody. I don't know. I, I've always kind of done my own thing. So now we're going to go deep for a quick second. When I was seven years old, my dad died. And so all I can remember from seven years old to about 16 years old is I would just do things by myself and just do the things that I thought were exciting or, you know, a lot of Lego building, a lot of building stuff, a lot of kind of going and exploring, you know, video games, all that kind of stuff. Like everything was kind of self-directed. And so I think I kind of carried that mentality forward in life, which is it, like for, for Twitch and programming, 
you know, I, I still feel like there wasn't there wasn't just a lot of really intense content that was I, I would I'd call it like in the true edutainment space. It was kind of really like we're going to build something and it's it's not as like engaging and you know. So I was just like, this is what I would want. I'm going to like build the thing I want. I'm not going to try to find somebody else that's doing it and model it after after what they're doing. I'm going to just build the thing I want. And so I've always been kind of self directed, if you will. For sure. So I can resonate if that with that answers very the question. De- yeah, very deeply. And like, like, is there a why behind it? Because you're like, oh, this is, this is what I think I want to see. Is it like, why do you want to see it there? Does that make sense? Uh, I think it makes sense. I, uh, well, there's several whys in life, uh, but the why for me of why I like to do it this way is that. I just couldn't, I, I still remember watching this video. I was trying to fix a Linux problem and I watched like a 10 minute video and it just never really got around to anything. And I just remember being really frustrated by tech content. I was just like, this is stupid, right? Because it just wasn't, it's just nothing, it was just, nothing was there. It's just, I just want something with some some feeling to it, right? And so that's kind of like the, why do I do Twitch? Or why do I do the content creation is ultimately, I didn't have anybody that did it the way I liked. and I also had no father figure. I had nobody in my life. I had none of that. I kind of had to make my own way, if you will. And so I'm trying to step into some of that for a lot of people because I know uh, a lot of people right now in the economic uncertainty, all those kind of things, like they, there's a, definitely like an epidemic of loneliness or meaninglessness, if you will. Vanity might be a better word for it. Like there's just like it doesn't feel like there's a lot. And so just trying to reemphasize purpose. Like there's definitely layers of purpose in life. And one of my, what I feel is one of my purposes is I really like the process of creation. It's just something I, I just really love that experience. And so it's something I just lean into. Like, you know, most people, they want to become bigger. They want to like build these really great prestigious projects in which everybody uses and maintains over lots of lots of years. It's just like, that's not necessarily for me. I want to build something. I want to go from A to B, call it a thing, and that's the thing it is, and then move on to the next thing I want to build. And so. Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense because, like, you know, following your Twitch stream or, like, just even the feedback we get on Front of Masters, they're like, you know, I was burnt out. I wasn't enjoying programming. I wasn't enjoying these things. And then I found your stream or I found your content or I found your courses. And they, like, reinvigorated my, like, love for programming and that creation process. So I'd say, like, yeah, what you're doing uh, hits the nail on the head. With. I want people to be excited. Yeah, yeah, you know? absolutely. Creation is super sweet, you know? Yeah, and then, uh, like, how has having uh, or being a father of four kids kind of changed your career or changed your, uh, you know, I don't know. How has it impacted you? I think when I was younger, I didn't have a good way to know what is valuable versus not. And I think that's, like, the biggest thing is that, I've just learned to value the current moment probably much more than I ever have. You know, when you have less time and you have things that are more important in your life, because, you know, I, I, this is going to probably be a, a semi-hot controversial take. A lot of people say phrases like, oh, I don't want kids, all these kind of stuff. Uh, the problem is, is that you don't really, no one really, like that first part of having a kid sucks, right? It's it's not fun. They're like little crying blubber machines that puke and and do all the wrong things. And it's just not, it's like not a fun experience, but you don't know the value of it. And it really can't be explained. It's like impossible to explain to somebody like exactly what it does to your life and how it changes you. It's kind of like when, when you get a dog, you realize how much you love this dog. And I remember having my two dogs, Jazz and Layla, and I just loved them so much. And they were just like, absolutely. And you know, like, it's just like, I couldn't, there's no way I could love something more than this. And then I have a kid and it's just like, I cannot explain to you how much the color was taken out of my love for the dogs. Cause it's just like, that is like, you can't even measure the two. And I had no idea I was even capable of that kind of love. I didn't even know that was a thing that was possible inside of my body. And so it's just like, it's only grown more and more fierce. And it's just like quite shocking what you're capable of. You just can't quite know what it is until it happens. And so it's just like been that for me where it's just like, there's just this huge wave inside of me now and so I really value things differently. And the time I do stuff, I really try to be in that, t- you know, like in that time. Yeah, I 100% resonate with what you're saying because I also happen to have a beautiful wife and four kids. You do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you do have the whole four kids right <laughs> yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we're like similar age, I guess. But um, 
I, I always had like all of these wild ideas. Um, I built them, I invested in them. I did like, I don't know, I just like made a ton of things, but it was, I felt like it was a little bit purposeless until it's like we had that first kid and I was like, okay, this is what I, it brought a lot of clarity. It was like, yeah. this is why I'm, this is what I'm good at, which is teaching people. This is why I'm doing it. I'm going to, I'm going to focus on this and, and I'm going to really make it work. I'm going to make it work to the point where, you know, it feeds my family, it feed, takes yeah. care of them uh, in a way. And it just like really did that love sort of like brings like a clarity towards yeah. time and towards purpose and towards yeah it's like oh okay i'm actually gonna take this seriously now i'm not in my like you know early 20s just building whatever i want to like let's let's make something that people really love and so yeah i totally resonate with what you're saying clarity is a good way to put it um yeah there's like the four loves people talk about the four loves uh i think in our world we focus really heavily on one of the loves eros right? Like the, 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 the sexy time love. Whereas, uh, you know, there's also other types of love and, uh, a, f- a phileo, right? I think that's how you say it, phileo or, and then there's philistorge and then there's, uh, eros and then there's agape. Uh, if I got them correct, I feel like I'm saying eros incorrectly, but anyways, agape is obviously like love of God to man. Um, eros is love between two people in the, in the sexy sense. Uh, philistorge is like familial, like love of the family or love a love of friendship, and so that's what Philadelphia is the brother, the city of brotherly love, right? It's it's after that word, and then uh, phileo is like the the love of family or love of somebody that doesn't like. I don't get something directly out of loving my child. Like yeah, I'll get a, I'll get a I'll get a father son relationship that eventually hopefully turns from uh, like police to coach to friend, right? Over all the years, but. Like, there's not a direct benefit. It's not like my job. I can love my job, but they directly benefit me. This one, I'm getting literally nothing out of it. And so it's like, and and that it grows and it slowly converts into something else. But I feel like that love is like really missing right now. People don't know a lot about that one. The the loving of, 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 of like caring for someone else caring, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Caring, a, 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 a form of caring. It's very difficult. Yeah. And it's not good. Like, it's not like I wouldn't put it up as fun activity, number one. Like, it's very hard, yeah. but it's also very great. And it's hard to say why it's great. <laughs> it's, you, you understand. Sure. But I'm yeah, just yeah. Trying, like, it's yeah, great. It's, it's, it's the best thing in the universe, but man, is it hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's impossible to tell you how hard it is. Absolutely. All right. All right. Uh, so what are you excited about next? Like, what are you in general? Uh, well, actually, I'm just really excited what's just directly in front of me. I don't really try to think too far ahead. Uh, there's a couple things. Okay, there is one thing that's a little bit further ahead that I'm just super pumped about. But right now, the thing that I'm most excited about is just I'm excited about going back and building some Vim things. i um, very excited about that. I uh, have a couple tools that I'm going to be building, kind of diving back into the developer productivity, reshaping my dot files, really just rethinking about everything. Kind of going to build something that's just what I really want. I'm in the process of rebuilding Harpoon 2. It's almost done. It's like if I just had an hour of time, it would be done. It's just like that close. It's wow. just that I just had to do these courses, right? Tomorrow yeah. is the final course, eight hours, or it's it's really going to be like four and a half to five hours of just pure whiteboard madness. And so that is that just consumes all my time right at this moment. But when that's done, I'm going to do that. And then the thing I'm future-wise super, super excited about, I got to do this once. I think it was October 26th. I live reacted to the next JS conference at Vercel. And I'm going to be able, I just it just went out on Twitter like two days ago. Uh, React Miami is going to have Theo and I and a couple, and like the, the speakers come on and we're going to be doing like live talking slash reacting to the conference talks. And for me, that is just super exciting because what that offers is that like it's it's like the ultimate thing. It's like you kind of are like the guy that's on ESPN mm. with the little headset mic, like talking about the game that's being played. I'm not yeah. playing the game anymore, right? But I am still excited about the game and I get to talk about the game and I get to be celebrating those moments. And I know I like to, you know, make fun of React a lot, but as I said earlier, there's a lot of great things that it has done. And I just love still seeing that it's it's still trying to find its place. And that's super cool. And so seeing these conference talks, you get to see people talk about something they're excited about and how they're trying to make it make sense in their world. And then the best part is, is that I'm going to be able to have them come on and talk to them and try to get like, I get to ask all those questions that maybe people wanted to ask during the talk. And so it's just, to me, that's like, that's my most exciting part. I think of the next two years is trying to make that a regular thing. 
how many conferences can we get this thing to happen at? And I'm very excited about that. It's like a caster. Yeah. Whatever. I don't think yeah. it's never really been done. It hasn't yeah. been done at any conferences. Hasn't been done. Next JS was the first one, I think, really to do it at all. Mm -hmm. uh, there may have been one right before. I think Netlify got Theo to do it once. And so that was the only one that I think I know about, but it's something I've been really wanting to do for like two years now. And it's just starting to open up. And I'm like, this is, I think this is super exciting. I just think it's a super, super exciting thing because I already have a huge platform, which means every talk doesn't just happen at the conference. It goes out, say, on my Twitch feed. Yeah. There's going to be thousands of people watching it there. So it's like, A, it's super great for sponsors and all that kind of stuff. But B, it just a lot of people get to hear about it. It's not just this. It, it, it makes things bigger and it's more fun. And there's lots of great questions yeah, out there. Yeah, it's not just the 200 people in the room, but it actually pulls in the yeah. outside world as well. Yeah. That's cool. Um yeah, and so how about like, I know you're saying you don't think too far ahead, but do you have any sort of like bucket list type things where you're just like, ah, I just really want to travel to X or whatever? I My only bucket list item right now is that my my uh, daughter, Livy, who is two, she, I want to not die until she's at least seven years old. I, I My goal is to get her older than when I was when my dad died. That's like, that is it. That's the only goal I have. Hopefully it works out. Obviously, I mean, I have like sub goals, like I want to love my wife well forever, but that's not really a goal. That's just like a daily commitment. And so I don't really call that a goal because there's not an end spot, but this is like my truest end spot. It's just, I got to make it to that. So there you go. That's my like goal. I gotcha. <laughs> it's not really a normal goal. Most people no. probably don't have that goal, but that's my goal. It means a lot to you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when you're thinking about like your just career in general and all these things that you just, it's like, you're always doing the next thing. Like what, I don't know. Is there, what is the theme behind it? Like what, why do you keep, you know what I mean? Like, is there something that ties like that type of progress together? You're just like, I'm just incredibly curious or I'm always like, you know what I mean? Like I, what? I'm obviously very curious, right? I think that any, any programmer, especially in the early or the late nineties to early 2000, you had to have a special level of curious because the internet really didn't have much information and you kind of had to do like a lot. You had to do a lot of soul searching to find anything. You know, you had to find people who could give you answers. Like it was, it was a very different experience. And so I think obviously huge driver in curiosity, uh, I got a second chance in life. Uh, you know, obviously at one point I'm off meth, porn problems, all those kind of things. God saved me. And now I live a normal life, which I never thought I would, would live a normal life. People always joke, you know, like no fap November. I've gone no fap 15 years. Feel pretty good about that. Feel pretty great about that. And so it's like, I have a purpose and I have something that I love, which is creation. And so it's just like, I get to just do that thing wholeheartedly. And I'm, it's awesome. So, I mean, I guess that's like the reason why, in a sense, is that I get a chance to be that person for somebody else. And I also got to do the thing that I think I'm designed to do, which is, I don't think it's like, I, I, I just want to create. Maybe there'll be something that I'll want to keep on creating and keep on making better and better and better beyond something small, but I don't know what that is yet. Cool. Well, I think that's I'm a... I'm looking. Don't yeah, know yet. I think that's a good, great place to wrap up. Yeah. Uh, thanks for... Thanks for doing this. Hey there, before you go, don't forget we're new at this. So any feedback, whether it's a like or subscribe, we'll take those or a comment about what you didn't like or what you'd like to see more of in the future. We'll definitely incorporate that into the next episodes. Uh, I'm really enjoying these conversations. So any type of feedback would be fantastic and especially sharing it with your friends and colleagues. So really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. See you in the next one.